Welcome to episode 44 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. Our topic for today is key concepts taught by institutions, family offices, and leading MBA programs. There are many, many ways to get a thorough understanding of the variety of real estate investment strategies out there. You can focus on real estate at a high level at college. You can work for a large firm with thousands of employees, or you can work for a small firm that will provide you with more flexibility. Well, I decided to have someone on who has a really interesting perspective on the amount of variety available out there because he has really done it all. Not only has he excelled at several different firms in various sizes, he also has extensive experience both on the equity side and the debt side, so really a well-rounded perspective on the real estate sector as a whole. While there are many underlying themes of investing in real estate in general, the truth is the size of the firm, the access to capital, the access to debt as well as the risk tolerance profile of the investors, all of these can make a big impact on the big picture thesis of the firm and the company's investment objectives. This is why it's important to get the perspective of someone who has had firsthand experience implementing such a variety of different strategies and seeing some of the main benefits as well as the hindrances of each. So in this episode, we're going to discuss what are some of the key differences when working at one of the largest institutions in the world to a much more flexible family office. We're also going to talk about how to maximize the effectiveness of your networking and actually build meaningful relationships with people you meet. We're also going to talk about how to build an appropriate capital stack for your investment. Now, obviously, debt is usually the vast majority of each real estate purchase that you make. So it's important to consider not only the term of that debt, not only the interest rate, but also who you're getting the money from. And we have an interesting conversation about that. And, and I think this is maybe the most interesting part, if our guest was currently managing a $100 million family office right now, what would be the big picture thesis and what that portfolio allocation would look like? And I think a lot of you are going to be interested in that conversation. Now, if you have only been following CFC since we started the podcast, then you probably think that the only thing that I've ever invested in is mobile home parks and cell storage. This is just simply not the case. I uh, originally founded the business with the intent of being as diversified and retail and office and multifamily, but it just became more and more challenging to find consistent deal flow in those more traditional asset classes. But this is simply not the case in mobile home parks and cell storage right now. In fact, there was a self-storage conference in Florida a couple weeks ago, and one of our managers made five offers on properties just from conversations that they had over that weekend. Uh, the reason for this is due to a combination of factors that hopefully a lot of you are already familiar with. If you're not, though, go to cashflowconnections.com and create an account. You will get a free ebook called Little Boxes, Big Profits, A Passive Investor's Guide to Self-Storage. It will give you a very good high-level understanding of why I think there's such an opportunity in that asset class in particular, and why I think that it's a really good asset class to make a bet on over the next five or 10 years. There's just tremendous amount of favorable risk-adjusted returns sitting there waiting for people to take advantage of. So just go to cashflowconnections.com, create an account, and you will get the ebook automatically sent to your email address. All right, hope you enjoy the episode. How's it going, everyone? Our guest for today is Serge Braccio, who is a first-year MBA student studying finance and entrepreneurship with an interest in real estate finance at Vanderbilt. Prior to joining Vanderbilt, he worked at Watt Investment Partners as a vice president in charge of real estate development and acquisitions. Watt Investment Partners is a division of the Watt Companies, a real estate firm headquartered in Los Angeles that focuses on retail, office, and multifamily developments in southern in southwestern United States. Serge grew up in Phoenix and received his BS in accounting from the University of Southern California, where he was also a presidential scholar and Ronald J. Kern Fellow. So Serge, really appreciate you coming on. Thanks again, man. Absolutely, Hunter. Happy to be here. So let's start with kind of a high level overview. Obviously, you have a tremendous background in real estate as a whole, you know, starting from your education first at, at USC and then moving into, you know, your your first I guess, entrance into the actual real estate sector, which is at Deloitte. So let's talk about how you kind of transitioned from your original space into, you know, one of the largest institutional players in the space. Yeah, no problem. So like you mentioned, I went to the University of Southern California for undergrad. And while in school, math was always sort of my strong suit. And so I knew I wanted to go into either finance or accounting. And after taking a few accounting classes, it kind of stuck with me. And I realized that I wanted to pursue that full time. So after school, um, I was fortunate enough to get a job in 2009 and went to work for Deloitte and Touche in their audit and enterprise risk services division. And so essentially, you start off working as an auditor 
uh, as a generalist. And then you have the opportunity to work on a couple of different clients in different industries. And one of those clients that I had a chance to work on was CIM, who is a, uh, a large private equity real estate firm that's headquartered in New York. So um, I really enjoyed the work that I was doing with them and ultimately decided that I wanted to declare real estate as my industry. But the problem was I did not want to be on the accounting side of things. So I tried to make the transition to real estate finance as opposed to real estate accounting. Okay, got it. And so, I mean, I guess, how long were you at Deloitte for and what were some of your key takeaways there, you know, when you ended up you know, transitioning over to your next uh, opportunity? Yeah, so I was at Deloitte for three years. Um, I had the chance to get promoted to senior and so started managing a team. And a lot of the work that we were doing was revolved around reviewing transactions that CIM had completed and looking at how they were valuing assets and what they were keeping the assets on their books at. Um, and so that was my real first foray into learning how to value a real estate asset. Um, and getting to see some of their different transactions was really interesting because CIM is a great organization, um, a lot of really intelligent people. And so just seeing how they put together deals and how they were creating value was really interesting. Okay, got it. And then after after Deloitte, what was that was that's when you transferred into Watt for the first time, correct? Uh, so actually, in 2012, um, I'd been looking for opportunities outside of the accounting space, and so that's when I found Mesa West Capital. So I went to work in Los Angeles for Mesa West Capital, um, and Mesa West is a large balance sheet lender. Uh, they specialize in doing bridge loans for commercial real estate. So they were kind of filling this space between assets where you couldn't get a bank loan. Um, but then you also didn't want a hard money lender. So there was this, there was this opportunity in between that they saw and took advantage of and, and were actually able to be extremely successful at. Uh, so I went over to Mesa West Capital and then I spent three years, uh, on the origination team analyzing different investments and, and ultimately making bridge loans. Okay, cool. And so what were, I guess, did you really enjoy the debt side of things or the equity side of things now looking back that you've been involved in both? That's a great question. Um, the two are very different on the debt side. The incentive for the company is to make smart debt investments, but to uh, increase your volume because ultimately the more money that you're able to put out, the more interest revenue you're able to generate. So uh, it was a more fast paced environment. We were looking at a lot of different deals in sub markets all across the U S a lot of different business plans, all different asset classes, so from that perspective, debt was interesting because I got to see and touch a lot of different product types, but I never really got to experience what it was like to operate an asset or to generate my own business plan. And so um, that's why I was attracted to uh, the equity portion of the capital stack. And ultimately, that's what led me to want investment partners. So debt was great. It was a really, it was a really good opportunity to start understanding real estate investing from the finance side. Okay, got it. And and what is essentially a large family office, uh, and they so I'm interested to see you know what their investment opportunities really look like, given that they have you know, a lot of flexibility. Um, what were some of the the key differences you noticed as you transitioned from a place like Deloitte, which is obviously just a major 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 player in terms of sky uh, capacity and infrastructure? and into a, a family office where I'm assuming you have much more flexibility, um, but just a completely different, probably culture overall. What are some of the changes there that you noticed uh, that really stuck out? So like you mentioned, what, what companies has been in existence for over 70 years? They've been investing in Los Angeles, primarily in the single family space and also in retail assets. They also have large office holdings now. They do a variety of different things. I was part of the Watt Investment Partners organization which One Investment Partners was created seven years ago with the purpose of being the acquisitions arm of Watt companies. Over time, the business plan for the group has morphed a little bit, and now they're more of a traditional private equity fund looking at development, acquisitions, dispositions within the southwestern U.S. But to your question, it was a world of difference. So at Deloitte, things were very highly regulated. Um, we had resources from, you know, 200,000 plus professionals all across the world. There was a Deloitte office in almost every major city across the world. Um, so the resources at your disposal were really startling. And then moving one step beneath that, I went to work for Mesa West Capital, who Mesa West was relatively small in terms of employee count. Uh, at the time, there were only 30 of us 
across the organization. Um, but they also had a, a really large amount of capital to put out. And so again, boiling it down, um, fewer resources, uh, but still a pretty sizable firm. And then moving over to Watt Investment Partners, we had a substantially smaller amount of money to invest at a substantially smaller company. And so, but the nice part about Watt is the Watt family is ultimately in the driver's seat. And so they are, they are the board that decides how capital is going to get invested, which investments ultimately will pass, which ones they want to uh, forego. And so you get to be a little bit more creative in that Watt Investment Partners wasn't just investing in office assets in this one submarket. So really any deals that would make sense would generate a risk-adjusted return that was appropriate for the family, you could invest in. So Mm -hmm. it was really intellectually stimulating and allowed you to be a lot more creative than it could have otherwise been at Mesa West or even at Deloitte. How many employees did the family office have? Um, Just give us an idea of the scale. So across Watt companies, um, and again, that's just Watt companies is the parent company and there are a number of subsidiaries. So across the whole organization, there are about 100. But my specific group, Watt Investment Partners, only had give or take five. Okay. That, so that I had makes two, managing director, two managing directors, myself, uh, an analyst, and then um, a few other employees. What was kind of the main objective in terms of real estate? I mean, you mentioned looking for risk-adjusted returns. That makes sense. I think that that makes a lot of sense. But was it exclusively focused on development? Were you also looking at value-add or stabilized deals? What was like the big picture thesis of of the capital that you're managing on your end of things? Um, so that's a good question. So there was there's there's an annual meeting every year where the Watt family. Um, talks amongst the board and they decide on an investment plan for the coming year. And so they pass down a general investment thesis, but then the group takes that investment thesis and you're able to be creative and come up with different ways of how you want to achieve that investment goal. So in the time that I was there, we looked at, um, we had a master plan community development in Littleton, Colorado. We had a creative office development in Los Angeles and Santa Monica. Um, we had also acquired a value add office property in Los Angeles. And so we really spanned the gamut of looking at a lot of different things. I wouldn't say there was exactly one box that we really fit into at, at Watt Investment Partners. Okay, cool. And that this is something that I certainly don't have a lot of background, you know, talking to people that are focused on family offices because a lot of them are very private. It's very hard to get accurate information. They obviously don't do marketing because they don't really need to. They're not raising capital, et cetera. So right. I, I'm not sure, like generally speaking in the family office space, is it typically the case that the actual heads of the, the family, do they do they typically operate as a board? Are they actively involved in the decisions? And at Watt specifically, you know, did they actually – ever say, you know, this is not a good idea, despite the fact that this may meet our objective, we're not really interested in this for this and this reason. Was there a lot of oversight, like on a a transactional basis? Or was it more the oversight involved in creating the thesis as a whole? Absolutely. It was both. So the Watt family is is very involved. Um, Ray Watt was the patriarch of the family and the founder of the company. And so throughout his lifespan, he was very involved in the day to day operations of the business. Um, Ray eventually passed the business on to Scott Watt, who was then, um, was then the leader of, of the Watt organization. But to answer your question, uh, they're very involved in the day to day. Um, they comprise the majority of the investment committee. They are ultimately the ones that are making decisions on which assets we invest in, which ones we pass on, um, as well as coming up with the more general, the more general strategy, um, for each coming year. So they're, they're definitely both. Okay, cool. Appreciate you kind of going through that. So obviously you have a tremendous background in real estate as a whole, educationally speaking, tremendous in terms of that, and then also getting you know a, a prominent job at some of the major players in the space and then working into a family office. What was some of the motivating reasons that you decided to end up pursuing the MBA program at Vanderbilt? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, it was a difficult decision. Um, I really enjoyed my position at Watt Investment Partners. I had um, 
I had the opportunity to work underneath two incredibly intelligent people who I knew that they, I knew that they were going places. And so I wanted to attach myself to them. And so it was a really difficult decision to leave. But ultimately, I knew that as a real estate investment professional, there was still a lot left that I wanted to learn. And so I thought coming back to get my MBA would at least lock in a baseline of education and open up some different opportunities that might not have been open to me before. Um, I'd had debt experience and then I had development and acquisitions experience from Watt, but, um, but I really wanted to understand the full picture. I wanted to uh, take some more involved classes on financial structures and entity creation and the legal side of it and land use and things like that. And so I thought taking a step back for two years and um, and having that opportunity would be good at this point in my career before I, before I got too much further along. Certainly, I, I think that certainly will pay off, and I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to you know watching that continue. Um, I'm really interested to hear some of the the key takeaways that you've learned, especially you know the fact that you've worked in a myriad of different asset classes, but also you know different structures and things like that. Um, let's talk first about networking. Is that something that was on your mind when you were considering going to the MBA program, or is that something that's just kind of the, the nature of the fact that you're you know going to be going to MBA, you're assuming that's going to happen? Um, how important is networking to you in making that decision as well? Networking is enormous. It's enormous from a career advancement perspective. It's enormous from being able to find deals. It's enormous in being able to capitalize deals. I mean, I can't stress enough the importance of having a strong network. I would attribute a lot of the success that I've had to date to the strength of my network. So finding the position at Mesa West Capital wasn't necessarily through my network, but finding the opportunity at WIP was certainly through my network. Um, Having the opportunity to do an independent study now that I've been at school was again through networking. Um, The internship that I'm taking this summer was through networking. So uh, it continues to come back around. um, And I just can't stress enough the importance of having that solid network. And so uh, for your listeners that are sort of wondering how to get involved, uh, some of my suggestions would be the Urban Land Institute is a fantastic organization within the real estate space that I'm sure many people are familiar with. Uh, They have regular meetings. They have different committees where people can get involved with something that aligns more so with their interests, whether that's development, acquisitions, uh, policy, um, things along those lines. Uh, similarly, NAOP is another large organization uh, that's more focused on development. Or even BizNow um, is a growing organization that has uh, a weekly newsletter based on different cities. They have um, they have meetings within those cities where uh, they'll be on different topics. Maybe uh, one that comes to mind is the future of Century City, or one was on... Um, the tech boom in Playa Vista. And so they do a really great job of making it relatable, um, but then also having panelists from the top investment firms and also providing you a lot of time to network. So I, I would highly recommend getting involved with those organizations. Yeah, those are those are really great suggestions. And I, I think the key there is that whatever locale you're focused on, uh, those are applicable to you, and not in terms of the actual the articles themselves, but the, the strategy of really expanding your network is completely applicable. Um, you know, one of the things we've talked about offline that I definitely want to circle back on for the purposes of the podcast is creating a appropriate capital stack on, a, on an investment basis. What are your, some of your thoughts on really implementing that, thinking about that from a big picture, and then effectuating that? Yeah. So actually, one last thing that I was going to say to just about networking before we move on to the capital stack is yeah, absolutely. Is just that um, networking is is also an art form. And one thing that we've learned uh, in business school that I find to be really applicable is that you can't, once you're networking in order to get something from somebody else, it's already too late. So people should start networking early when you're not necessarily in need of funding a deal or you're not in need of sourcing a deal. Because starting to form those relationships when it's more so about meeting people and actually connecting is a much more powerful way to go about networking than having a 30, 60 second conversation with somebody and immediately trying to cut to the point of, oh, do you have dry powder to invest in this deal? Are you looking, you know, that comes off so much more disingenuine than actually being able to have a conversation with somebody. So do it and do it early. 
You know what? That's a great point. And I, I want to add something to that as well. I, I've seen a lot of people. So networking, going to actual networking events, it, especially in Los Angeles, can be very challenging because it's, it's difficult to get around. Uh, during rush hour in particular, which is when they're usually held, right? So, absolutely. you know, when you see people walk up and say, okay, I'm a property manager and I'm, you know, I'm looking for investors. And if the person's like, oh, I'm also a property manager, they're like, okay, great. Then I don't need to talk to you at all. That right. is not <laughs> the strategy to make your networking event be more efficient because that's really what you're trying to, you're trying to compensate for the fact that you just spent an hour and a half in traffic. You want to meet as many people as possible. Just going through that and making insignificant introductions to people, um, that's not the way to do it. So I couldn't agree more and I've never really thought about it in that exact way, which is that your goal to going to networking events should be actually to network, to establish a relationship with someone right. because – Every body that I've ever done a deal with, I mean, they're a group of five people that are probably responsible for about 90% of all the deals that I've ever done right. in the sense that them and their network, et cetera. So don't underestimate the power of this. And, um, you know, actually, you know, I want to mention this is something that, you know, I think you are very good naturally at, which is just meeting pers- meeting people, being engaged. Um, do you have any tips for people in terms of that? Obviously, you know, the going in, the mentality of building a relationship is going to help a lot. But do you have any thoughts in terms of like strategies or tips uh, from that from a functional standpoint? Yeah, absolutely. Get to get to the event or whatever you're doing early, be one of the first people, and then you have a less stressful environment that you can start to connect with people. And also the main tip that people don't really pay attention to is just to listen. So don't go in with a script of saying, okay, this is who I am. This is who I'm looking for and immediately start to put people in boxes. Just have a real conversation. If somebody wants to talk about the fact that they just got a dog or where they live, or maybe they like to surf for a sporting event, just listen and analyze and then play off that and, you know, have a natural conversation instead of a really forced one where to your point earlier, you meet somebody that does property management, you automatically put them into a box and set them aside. Maybe that's not what you're looking for, but you never know who else they know. Um, so just having those genuine conversations and, and, and getting there early to do it in a more natural environment, I think is really powerful. Cool. Love it. I'm glad we had that extra little bit of conversation because I think it's th- those details are really beneficial. So let's. I definitely want to talk about capital stack. Let's talk about you know briefly forming capital stack. How you view a capital stack as being appropriate for a particular opportunity, as well as how it relates to the investment thesis. What are your thoughts on that from a big picture? Yeah. So this is a good one. So ultimately, I think in sort of the personal investing space, it's really difficult to have a lot of different options in your capital stack choice. You're limited by the amount of equity that you yourself can contribute, the amount of equity that you can raise, your debt options, uh, whether you have to go recourse, non-recourse. So it's it's limiting. Um, but the one thing that I would say is uh, there's you should certainly be aware of of the different structure that you're considering. So there are always different debt options that you can explore. You might just try to take the easy route and go look online or talk to one broker, get bank debt, and that's fine if that works for you, but you should always be cognizant of the level of leverage that you're using um, and also the source. Um, so there are, there are different options for people. For instance, a community bank might be a great option. You might be able to get a lower interest rate and that community bank not might not have the option of being very selective with their investments. So maybe... If you're looking at a transitional value add deal, it might be a perfect fit for that community bank. Um, there are also a lot of great resources online these days where you can shop around for different interest rates and different products. So I would, I would urge people to not just take the first uh, loan that you get approved for that comes your way and to really think about, is this the best loan for my personal financial situation? Is this the best loan for the property um, is it going to allow me the flexibility to implement my business plan and exit in the timeline that I'm thinking, or am I going to ultimately run into a maturity default? Um, or am I not going to be able to make the debt service? So that was one thing that, um, I think non-institutional investors sort of screw up is that they don't select the right capital stack for the transaction. Um, and then I guess just to take that one step further, one thing that has been interesting in some of the research that I've been doing lately has been in public policy and public incentives and how they help private developers. And so Los Angeles 
And a lot of cities across the country actually have groups that are dedicated just to helping private investors secure public funding. So I would tell your uh, listeners that um, if you just do a simple search online for um, economic development loans or public incentive programs for real estate loans, uh, you'll find a lot of good resources um, that your inv- that your listeners might actually qualify for, in which case you might have lower interest rates than you'd be able to get at the market. Um, you might not need to go out and syndicate as much equity for investments because now you're able to get a 10% 10% of your capital stack from public funds. So just be aware yeah. of those options. That's a, that's a great suggestion. And I think that who the capital is coming from, which is kind of your per- first point there, is really, really critical. Um, particularly if you are in asset classes that aren't as well known. I mean, multifamily, it doesn't really have a problem with liquidity yep. in, in any stage of the cycle. But when you're looking at things like self-storage and mobile home parks, which have been my focus of my business for quite some time, that source is really important. And you want to make sure that they actually understand the business. So what we saw a lot happen, you know, in in previous cycles is that the demand for these products is very, very stable and even sometimes recession resistant or counter cyclical. But if a lending institution that doesn't understand self storage in particular uh, is the one that's in charge of determining the value of the property, it may be challenging for them to see it from your perspective. So, you know, one of the things, one of the major pieces of due diligence that I look at is who is the lender and do they have an asset class specific arm so that if they have you know, 30 employees, 100 employees that are exclusively focused on something like self storage or exclusively focused on Texas multifamily 100 unit plus, you're going to be in a much better position if they actually understand the asset class in the event that something goes sideways um, related to the debt service coverage ratio or balloon payment, etc. So I think that's a really good point and very, very underutilized. Most investors don't even know who the lender is, let alone, you know, their background in the space. So um, yeah, great point there. I was just going to say further to that, yeah, you need to you need to understand, is your loan going to get syndicated? Is the person that you're going to be dealing with in the future, uh, your servicer, somebody different than who you talked to when they were originating the loan? So, you know, and that goes back to the value of your network. Maybe you can find people that have those debt connections, or maybe you can bring on an equity investor who has a great local bank connection or a debt fund connection where they can bring that party to the table and help you put together the best capital stack for the project. Totally, because you know, similar to the networking thing, when everything is going well, uh, these conversations are not hard to have. The problem is you need to actually have those second options in place in the event that we do have some kind of correction, particularly when it comes to the capital markets. Yep. So um, coming to a lender and saying, look, we're in a terrible situation, you're not in a very good situation from a leverage perspective at that point. So um, just something to keep in mind. Now, a lot of the listeners to the program invest in passive deals, but many of them have both passive and active deals. I wanted to get some of your perspective on actively owning real estate. What are some of the key takeaways when it comes to actually being the, the manager, the partner, the owner? owner of the property itself? Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> so in my role at Watt, we were active investors. We were operating the properties on a daily basis. And so uh, I guess a few a few takeaways that I would put forth. And, and now, is, is there a specific product type that you would like me to focus on or just sort of some general takeaways from best practices and operating? Yeah, I mean, I think that your background with a variety of different asset classes is appropriate for this conversation in the sense that big picture stuff, um, you know, obviously leases is one of those major factors that I think that you have a lot of background in and, and understand significantly based on your experience at, at WIP particularly. Um, so if you want to just talk about leases, that'd be great. Or if any other stuff comes to mind in terms of, you know, overall management, onsite due diligence, et cetera, that that would be appreciated as well. Sure. Okay. So, so when you're looking at acquiring a new asset and you're underwriting the property, uh, they generally give you the service contracts, right? So if let's say it's an office an office building and they tell you that we have this contract with the landscaper. We have this contract with the management company. A lot of times I think it might just be easy to roll those service contracts forward and say, you know, the last owner probably did their diligence. This is the best rate that we can get. These guys have done a good job. Let's not rock the boat. I think one, one aspect of a good active manager is to be constantly looking at not only the revenue that you're generating at the property, um, because that's easy. You're looking at leases, you're looking at new tenants, but to really focus on the OPEX side of the equation and structure your service contracts 
with shorter timelines. So that way, if those come up every year, every two years, you can start to rebid those and make sure that your contracts that you have in place are the most competitive rates that you can get in the marketplace. So that's that I would say is a good tool for the active investors, just making sure that you're always getting the best rates and good service. Um, I would also say that developing relationships with general contractors is a fantastic practice, especially in this day and age where GCs are so spread thin. Having a good relationship with somebody who in turn has good relationships with subs helps you get jobs done faster. It helps you get jobs done on time um, and ultimately lowers your, your cost of construction or your cost of TIs. And they can also save you money in the long run. And then back to your point about leases. Uh, yeah, there are certainly some techniques with structuring leases and best practices. I guess, do you want me to uh, sort of talk about some, maybe a few of those lease structure takeaways? Yeah, lease structure would be awesome. Okay. So as most of your listeners know, I'm sure uh, you can go with a full service gross lease or a triple net lease. Uh, there's different structures for how reimbursements are dealt with at a property. So I would always advise non-institutional investors, active investors to structure their leases with triple net leases as much as possible. And what that means is that all operating expenses at the property are ultimately going to be passed back to the tenant. And so from a cash flow perspective, that's going to make for the most consistent and dependable cash flow at the property. And so pushing for triple net is good. If you can't get triple net, um, there's also a lease structure that's called base year where you can set expenses at whenever the lease is signed. Um, let's say it's 2018 and that serves as your base. Any subsequent expense increases past that amount are then passed through to the tenant. So it's another way in which you can start to smooth your, uh, your revenue at the property. And then there are also certain protections within a lease that landlords should look to structure. Relocation rights are a good one. So what that would essentially mean is if you as a landlord have a tenant come to you that says, I really want 5,000 square feet of, of space in this building. I'm willing to pay a premium for it, but I only want to be on the first floor and I want to have access to the courtyard or something along those lines. That, As the landlord, that allows you the opportunity to then shift around other tenants within the building to accommodate that tenant. So having a relocation right in your lease um, is, is advantageous for the landlord. And then, I mean, the list can go on from there. Having what you actually define as pass-through expenses for a property, generally that is limited to things like utilities, property taxes, insurance, management fees. But in structuring your lease, it's really a negotiation. You can actually start to include things, maybe annual renovations to common areas. Uh, maybe that's passable onto your tenants or replacement of lights in common areas. So you can maybe start to add in some things that otherwise you might've just eaten as a capital expenditure, but now those are actually getting passed through um, to tenants. So starting to think about lease structure is really powerful. And there's a lot of different structural techniques that landlords can take to, to protect themselves and also to smooth their cash flow over the long run. Yeah, I think those are excellent points. I think the big picture there is certainly that it's just a contract between two parties or, or multiple parties between you know the manager and the tenants, and everything is negotiable. Right. So as detail oriented as you want to be, that can be the result of the contract. Right. So I mean, I remember the first time I saw a net, a triple net lease, and I was like, okay, what's the operating expense ratio, basically, you know, from a manager's perspective, and really the answer is is zero to a certain extent. I mean, if the building is a simple building and there's not a lot of communal areas, et cetera. But once you look in, you basically you know expand that Excel uh, document, that Excel pro forma, you're going to see a lot of line items that should be included that may cause you to have some kind of overrun. And so really what Serge is kind of going through is all of that's negotiable, right? There doesn't Absolutely. necessarily have to be any overrun. So it's definitely something to consider, especially when you're talking about structuring things and you know limiting your expenses and really making things extremely accurate from a projection standpoint. Yep, um, absolutely. What, one of the things I want to talk about, obviously, is risks. Um, what are the major risks you see in terms of you know not only active management of real estate, but also in terms of you know real estate as a whole, that'll really have a, the, the possibility to negatively impact a deal? What are the first things that come to mind when it comes to that? Um, good question. So I guess when I think about it, um, the biggest risk 
for an active manager is going to be, you know, maybe an overconfidence with your current rent roll and thinking that you have tenants that have been in the building for a long time. They're going to continue to stay. You don't really need to spend too much money upkeeping the building or, or incentivizing them through TIs or whatnot, but that's not always the case. And so you might be surprised when 18 to 12 months prior to one of your major tenants lease expiration, they give you notice that they're leaving and then you are left scrambling to find a new tenant when you've sort of been neglecting the building all along. And so that makes it, that impacts your release ability and impacts your cash flows. And so one way to mitigate that is to start talking to your major tenants early and have the conversations and say, you know, we're, we know that you're coming up in 36, 24 months. We just want to know, are you happy with the building? Are you intending to stay? And just sort of take their temperature on where they're at. And if they're looking at other properties in the market, that way you can just plan as best as possible for any potential holes in your rent roll. I would just say, you know, making sure that you are actively talking to your tenants, whether you're investing in multifamily, whether you're investing in office retail, just keeping an open line of communication to understand where people are at is important to understanding how well you're doing and, and what your rent roll is going to look like in 12 or 24 months. And so as much of a head start as you can get, that allows you to put the space back on the market and it really minimizes that downtime in between leases, which is is cash flow accretive. Got it. Got it. What about um, let's say real estate as a whole, not not only just the active management, but also just from a big picture. Um, what are some of the ways that you know you see risk entering the market, and and some of the ways you can mitigate those risks? Oh boy, that's a pretty broad question. Um, of course, it is. <laughs> you want to you want to start talking about real estate real estate riskiness, huh? <laughs> so I would say they're they're macro economic factors that are always going to impact the real estate market, right? So you now have um, an administration that has been known to uh, produce legislation pretty quickly and pretty haphazardly. And so you have changes to not only tariffs that are being enacted on other countries, you have changes to tax law. Uh, It seems like every day that I wake up, I get a new push notification on my phone about um, some change that's being enacted. So those sort of macroeconomic shocks and what they do to the economy um, are really scary for real estate. For instance, the steel tariff um, was one that has the potential to really impact real estate and drive up construction costs. And so that for me is the scariest aspect of real estate investing right now. It's trying to identify asset classes that are going to withstand the next macroeconomic shock. I mean, we are in the the ninth year of recovery, we're in a cycle um, of extended growth where this is starting to border on uh, on a historical example. And so a lot of people are predicting that there's going to be a downturn, not if, but when. And so starting to tailor your investments to make sure that you're protected on the downside is really important at this stage in the market. So that for me is the scariest thing is what's going to be the next macro shock that really rocks the boat and then just sends investors tumbling and sending property prices down. Well, see, that's why I ask open, broad questions like that, because I think that's actually a really interesting point. And, you know, I, I wouldn't going to be able to predict that uh, the steel tariffs would be your answer. So I, I do appreciate going into those details. And what are you seeing right now in terms of catalysts? I mean, what are some of the major things you check every morning to see if we are turning around? And, you know, how are you getting that data? What, what's, what's the driving factor right now that you see in terms of the, causing that potential downside? So I guess, would it be safe to assume that most of your listeners are probably invested in smaller single family and multifamily assets, as well as potentially like office and retail? Yep, pretty much across the board. Um, you know, the, the focus of the podcast is on commercial real estate, but since single family is usually what most people start out with, there's a lot of people that have invested in that as well. So, you know, everything from single family to office to retail to self-storage to mobile home parks and everything in between? So the biggest risks for me right now, like I mentioned, um, any sort of new legislation uh, that comes out is scary. Also, the Fed, uh, with their current schedule to raise interest rates three more times over the next 12 months, uh, starts to make it a little bit scarier. I think you've had you've had deals that have priced at, at really high values And the only way that investors are making those high values work is because they're getting really attractive and accretive financing. So if you think about what starts to happen when interest rates rise and you can no longer go out and get that 3 to 4% bank loan on your property, 
you're not going to be able to to bid as much um, ultimately and meet your return threshold that you need to meet. So the effect of interest rates on the prices of property is also scary. Um, and the Fed's predicting that it goes up to 2.9% by the end of 2019 for their federal index rate. So that's scary to me. Quite, quite frankly, Trump is scary and his sort of policy on America first and his his desire to not make these bilateral trade agreements and sort of take that stance, that's scary. I don't know what that's going to do to imports and exports. And so all of those economic factors, if they have an effect on the equities market and stock prices start to go down, that has an effect on the real estate market. So I would say I'm, I'm always paying attention to what the Fed is doing with interest rates. I'm always paying attention to um, what new legislation is coming out. And then I'm also looking at some of the some of the real estate indicators like the, uh, the case Schiller index. I'm looking at, um, how REIT performance is doing in the market. And then I'm also just paying attention to trades at a more micro level. So looking at, uh, where assets are selling in Los Angeles, where they're selling in Nashville and starting to pay attention to some of those markets that I'm more actively involved in. Totally. And I'm glad that you kind of retouched on the, the trade agreement stuff, because I think this is actually really critical. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding out there because of the amount of, special interest groups which have the capacity to lobby and create unions, et cetera, that, that is not a benefit to society. I mean, she, you mentioned steel earlier. You know, the analogy is really as straightforward as if you live south of the grocery store you go to, it's not going to help the people south of the, the street that if you say, I'm never going to go north of the street again. It's just going to make you have to go get groceries somewhere else that's not as convenient or efficient. So that's kind of the argument there. So, I like that. you know, Serge, this is something I want to talk about, you know, that i really, really interested to get your perspective on. Let's say that you were kind of on the board of the committee. You know, you're the head. You're the, the patriarch of the, of the Whip family right now. You have a – let's say you have a $100 million portfolio. What would be your, you know, overall – investment thesis in terms of where you would be allocating that hundred million dollars right now. Come on, you think I'm gonna you think I'm gonna share the, the special thoughts with you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well you do have you do have a hundred million dollars. So just how are you allocating that hundred million? <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that hundred million. So I think there are still a lot of areas within commercial real estate where you can make value. Um, I told you this once before offline, but um, ultimately I still see growth within the single family and multifamily segment. So you have this trend of millennials who have increased wages, but can't afford their down payment. I was actually just looking up a statistic this morning and 66% of millennials aged 21 to 32 have zero saved for retirement. And so you have this group of, you have this age group that really isn't saving for the future. They aren't saving for retirement. They're not putting anything in their savings and they're they're spending their disposable income. And so what that means is that when it comes time for them to settle down and they, they turn up home buying age, they can't afford the down payments. And then there's also going to be a compounding effect with rising interest rates where now they can't afford and they can't afford the interest rates. They there's tightening credit. They can't get the same loans that they once could. And so you have this increasing pressure on apartment rents. And so across the U S we've seen apartment rental rate growth and uh, in a lot of markets, getting to these kind of unsustainable levels. If, uh, if you look at San Francisco, um, rental rates there have crossed over $5 a square foot, $6 a square foot sometimes in places. And, uh, in, and normally investors would say, that's not sustainable. Um, that's crazy. You know, There's going to be a correction that's going to knock that back down to earth. But the alternative is, is what? Um, people moving further out to the suburbs, people buying houses, Ultimately, I don't think that there's going to be a big shift and millennials are all of a sudden going to be able to start affording down payments for houses. And as long as there isn't a major macro shock that causes a big unemployment, um, the unemployment rate to go up, then you have this group of people that are continuing to earn more and experience real wage growth, but yet they can't buy a home and they don't want to move out to the suburbs. So it's going to keep putting upward pressure on apartments. So I think that there's uh, a real opportunity to buy assets that might seem overpriced right now, buy quality, well-located assets that maybe are class B, renovate those to class A or class C to class B. And the rents that you're going to have to underwrite on a post-renovation basis to make that work might seem crazy. But ultimately, unless, unless there's a major change, I don't, think that, I don't think it is that crazy. I think for the right investment, I think you can underwrite 
rents that haven't really been experienced before. And I think there is some value there. Um, so what I would be looking for right now is definitely cash flow. I'd be looking for safer investments that are more downside protected. And I wouldn't be taking a lot of giant development risks at this stage in the cycle. So I think there's still some value left in multifamily. I think that I think just starting to analyze different shifts in uh, the way that we're working, that we're living. Yeah, I would say I would put the majority of my money in multifamily. I would also put some money in office. Um, I think finding a well-located office asset that's near that's near where executives are living. Maybe you can find a Class B office uh, that's really well located, but it hasn't seen a lot of love. And renovating that so that way you're catering to those executives within the neighborhood. I think that's another good investment opportunity. So maybe I'd put 50% of my money in multifamily, 25% in office, and then I would take the other 25% and bifurcate it into some debt investments if I could to sort of protect myself in a downside. Yep. And then also put the put the rest of the money in maybe some more speculative developments something that lends itself really well to different tech trends. So maybe building an industrial park um, near an airport, maybe building an industrial park near a projected new highway or, or population center or something along those lines. Awesome. Well, I, I appreciate you giving your $100 million portfolio allocation there. It's much appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, one of the things that, that kind of, I, I definitely know that this is a, a topic of conversation right now in the space. I don't have a lot of background investing in office. Um, I'm interested to hear your perspective on, you know, the transition that industry is going through right now, given that you have, you know, a tremendous background in the industry and also, you know, of that portfolio, it, it's a significant portion, um, you know, with, with things like WeWork, for example, what are your thoughts on how that industry is positioning and where do you think that industry is going to be in five or 10 years? So, major trend, as I'm sure everyone's aware, is towards creative office. And that's sort of been the buzzword for the last five years within commercial real estate. Um, people are starting to build larger open floor plans um, and collaborative workspace, if you will. But then you've also seen some tenants want to shift back and say that now they're coming out and saying that those large open floor plans and collaborative workspaces aren't so collaborative and that their employees are actually wanting offices and private spaces where they can talk on the phone and they can have more private conversations. Right. So... Ultimately, I think the shift, I think part of the creative office revolution uh, is here to stay forever. And I think that's having um, nice outdoor spaces, uh, amenitized product. I think that's really important for the next generation that's coming in and making those real estate decisions for their companies. I don't think that large open floor plans are going to be here to stay forever. I think people are going to want to have their own space. But I think flexibility is really key and having the ability to move around walls and accommodate growing companies. So I see there being a pullback on really cheap looking, um, bright colors. You see a lot of rehabs of older buildings that are now just getting a new coat of paint and they're knocking down some walls, putting up some glass and then releasing it as creative space. I think that product is going to, going to become obsolete. And I think instead people are going to be focused on quality, well-located office that's close to transit centers. So um, the workforce of today wants to be close to where they live. They want to be close to transportation hubs. They want to be close to the airport. And I think spaces overall are going to shrink. So I guess to summarize, to summarize all of those thoughts, a building that is easily subdivisable, because I don't think companies need as much space anymore, a building that offers quality outdoor spaces, um, and I think a building where the owner has done a good job with the renovations where they actually appear to be quality and aren't just a coat of paint are going to continue to be well leased versus some of those other more haphazard conversions. Awesome. Well, well, we'll definitely have to have you on in the future to talk more about office in particular because th those are some really great points you touched on. And, and like I said, I don't have a lot of experience investing in it. So, um, you know, before before we go, I definitely want to get, you know, you've been through the gambit of commercial real estate that exists um, all the way from, you know, a very large institution to a family office, from debt to equities, retail, office, multifamily, et cetera. What would be one piece of advice that you would give someone who's just recently graduated undergrad that's looking into getting commercial real estate? What would you direct them towards? So somebody who's, I'm sorry, somebody who's just graduating, what? Yeah, so someone who just graduated undergrad that's 100% dedicated to commercial real estate that's interested in getting in the space, what would be a piece of advice that you would give them? Oh, okay. Um, so I would say start to get involved in the same networking groups I mentioned earlier, ULI, NAOP, is now. I think that's a great way to meet real estate professionals. 
Um, real estate is one of those industries where the recruiting process is not as structured as it might be in, say, investment banking or consulting. So it's really about getting out there, networking, and showing a genuine interest, but also showing that you've done your homework. And so one of the best pieces of advice I can give is pick a deal somewhere in the city that you live in and start to underwrite it and start to think about it like you yourself are going to invest in it. So maybe take a you know a four unit apartment building and then walk through the entire acquisition process and the renovation process and think about all of those different aspects and if you don't know something in that process start to research it so that way when you finally meet a real estate professional and you tell them that you're interested um you actually have something meaningful to contribute to the conversation and you can say you know I'm looking at this property in Santa Monica I think it's a great value because uh, my plan is to acquire it and renovate it and do X, Y, Z. Ultimately, I think I could sell it for this. And I think this would be my return. If you can walk through all of those steps, what that says to me as a real estate professional is that this guy's really interested. This guy's done his homework. He's intelligent. And he knows what it takes to uh, to operate in this business. And so I think that's the most powerful tool is just be more prepared than the person next to you and network, 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 network. Awesome. Well, Serge, I really appreciate you coming on, man. We covered a ton of ground. So thanks again. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. All right, listeners, thanks for checking out the episode. As always, the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page, which is hosted on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Stitcher. Don't forget, if you want access to some of the free goodies that I'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes, like free ebooks, weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again.